Christmas came early this year. Actually, it came really early, like back in April, but it took all that time to find the part that I needed to make this thing work, a tiny Raspberry Pi computer. This custom game gear can emulate thousands of games from game consoles, arcade games, even from Mac or DOS computers. This thing is the fulfillment of a childhood dream. Growing up, there were three types of families, Nintendo families, Sega families, and families that didn't get to experience the joy of kids fighting over the single working controller. And back then, you couldn't save games. My older brother would take over the console when we rented a new game from the video store. He'd have it on pause for days, and I'd just have to wait, hoping he would hurry up and beat the game so I could have a go. Since I was the youngest at the time, I would usually experience games through my older brother and sister. Then, after they were done, I'd have an hour or two before I had to bike it back over to Blockbuster. Needless to say, it was rare I'd beat a game myself unless we owned it. And games were expensive, so we really only had like two. We started out with a Nintendo, but in 1990 we got a Sega Genesis. Let me tell you, that upgrade was a revelation. And more games were two-player, like NBA Jam, so I got to play more. But I was still number three on the totem pole. A couple friends had Nintendo Game Boys, and they were pretty neat, but I never really liked that screen. There was no backlight, and it wasn't even color. Color. Hey, there's an easier way to get color. This slab of plastic was six-year-old me's holy grail gaming device. If I had one of my own, I would be able to play through a whole game without seeing someone else play it first. But back then, I didn't have the IT skills to make enough money to buy one. So instead, I would wait for my cousin to bring his to a family party, or a friend to the playground. And again, I would be at best second on the totem pole, and I'd only get a few minutes to play. But that screen, it was so rich with all those 4,000 colors. And Nintendo had nothing on it. Hey man, get portable. Get a Game Gear Supersonic Sports Pack. A color portable Game Gear, carrying case, and two hit games. Game Gear Supersonic Sports Pack. You know who makes it. Coffee? Tea? Stack up! You know, in hindsight, those early 90s commercials don't really age well. And looking back on it, this thing was a brick. Not as portable as the Game Boy, and it would eat through batteries too, so I don't think my parents would have appreciated that. But I still wanted one. Every Christmas, I would ask for one, until at some point, the Game Gear just faded into irrelevance. Well, Christmas is right around the corner, and you know what? I saved up enough money this year. But they don't sell these things anymore. How did I get this one working so well? I bought a used broken Game Gear. I actually have two now. This blue one here is from Julian from Brady Repairs. He's the guy who basically rescued us on the Mr. Beast set wiring project earlier this year. He is literally like the button savior for me. <laughs> oh yeah? He's the only one here who's like good at doing the little crimps that we need. I yeah, that crimp did like hard, man. 600 of them and I can't feel my fingers. The sad thing is these things are dying by the thousands and tossed in the trash. It's a shame because they are decently comfortable. I mean, the form factor's having a bit of a resurgence with the Nintendo Switch and the Steam Deck. Stick a modern LCD on it and RetroPie, and these shells can have a new life. And that's exactly what I did with this. Z-Arcade is a retro game company in the UK run by John Madison. He designed a kit to completely gut and replace the innards of any broken Game Gear with a Raspberry Pi. I reached out last year, and John kindly sent over this kit early this year, but it took until last month to find a compute module I could buy to put in it. So now that I finally have that, it's time to open up the Game Gear. And you know what? That reminds me of this video's sponsor, Grid. Now, I actually talked to Grid Studio last year too, and it's been so long they probably forgot about the sponsorship. So I might not even get paid for saying this, but I still think it's cool enough to show you pay or no pay. This is a completely torn down Game Gear in a beautiful display. Grid has this and a bunch of other retro tech available on their store. And like the iPhone teardown I gave to my dad for Father's Day, each one is a beautiful work of art. And this one in particular highlights how far we've come since early 90s handheld gaming. I mean, look down here. This thing is the backlight for the screen. No wonder this thing chewed through batteries. Half the board space is dedicated just to the display circuits. Nowadays, we have thinner, brighter, and better screens and cleaner audio circuits, and, well, you get the idea. But I love how Grid's frame devices are put together like the works of art they truly are. So many devices, even mass-produced handheld game consoles, are works of engineering art, and I'm all here for it. Check out Grid Studios using the link in the description. Now, instead of ripping apart this blue Game Gear, I actually found a shell on eBay for just a few bucks. It's not in perfect condition, so I also bought a few extra buttons and a new front screen cover from Handheld Legend. They also sell a ton of other replacement parts, so if you're missing something, that's a great site to visit for parts. But I dumped everything out and started organizing. I got the full Mame Gear kit. 
At the center of everything is this board with the LCD and button pads on one side, and plugs to mate the Pi, power, and audio to the daughter boards on the back. You can actually use a bunch of different Pi models, like the Zero, Zero Two, or A+, or even a CM4 like I'll be using with this adapter board. I'll be putting that board inside this used shell. It could maybe use a little more cleaning, but I'll save that for some other time. This little power board plugs into the main board, and it has USB-C power input, supports up to two batteries, and has an on-off switch that runs a safe shutdown of the Pi. This expansion breakout plugs into the Pi's USB and microSD slots, and lets you get at those through the Game Gear cartridge slot. And here's a comparison of the Game Gear's original audio board and the one for Mame Gear. The circuit's a lot smaller nowadays. Then I have a bunch of odds and ends, from these neat Sonic stickers to all the extra buttons, membranes, and screws I might need. There isn't currently a full text guide on how to put these things together, so I had to watch a couple YouTube videos on how to do it. This video is not going to go quite that deep, but the one part that was a little daunting was drilling extra holes for four buttons. This isn't absolutely necessary. I mean, you can play any of the Game Gear games with just the two built-in buttons, but I wanted to be able to play almost any retro games, so I bought this resin button holder bracket, and then decided to also 3D print a drill template. My printer didn't do the best job since I haven't used it in a while and forgot to level the bed, but it's good enough. Now, if you do this, it's probably the hairiest part of the whole build. It's tough for a few reasons. Drilling plastic is hard, and then there's the interior metal coating that'll bite into the drill bit. Plus, you can't easily clamp down the shell or you risk breaking it. So for me, I took the top case home so I could use my drill press. I drilled slowly, being careful to not chop my fingers up in the pit. Probably safer to clamp it down somehow, but it worked out okay, and my fingers are all still here. After a bit of cleaning up with the rasp, I tried to get the edges as neat as possible. I actually missed a little on one of the holes, so my half-inch hole became a little more like an oval, but all's well that ends well. I made sure everything actually worked before I put it inside the case. So I plugged it all in, and carefully flipped it over and tested it out. And it works! It's not very easy to use without the case, though. The buttons are a little finicky that way. But now it's time to get this thing all put together. One thing that immediately made it look a thousand times better was replacing that beat-up old screen cover. I used a utility knife, but I probably could have been a little more delicate. The top edge has a little bit of a scratch now. I picked off all the remaining adhesive with my pliers so the new glass could stick on cleanly. And the new glass is almost a perfect replica. It certainly looks a thousand times better. No having to look through a hazy, scratched-up screen anymore. But assembly was just a matter of lots of little screws and lots of little plugs. It's always a bit cathartic to put together hardware like this, especially after you work with some of the ridiculously tiny wiring on some SBC hardware. Plugging everything in, you have to kind of hold it half open like a book, and a few of the wires are a bit annoying, but only the speaker wire got caught up in the case when I closed it up. I wound up having to tape that down to the main board, but now it's time to see if it still works. I like having that splash screen to quickly confirm that the screen and the speaker both work. And if I scroll through and find Sonic for Game Gear... It works too! <laughs> I did experience a little stuttering, and after some testing I found out some of the default emulators need to be changed to get full speed on the Compute Module 4. Like on Sega Genesis, I swapped out the default Genesis Plus GX for Pico Drive. Otherwise, like when I was playing Earthworm Jim, a lot of the game could be a choppy mess. With Pico Drive, I got 60 FPS all day long. And before I tested other games, I also plugged in a keyboard. That's right, this thing has USB. You couldn't do that on an old Game Gear. Using a keyboard, you can use the Linux console directly on the Game Gear, and, well, the screen isn't great for text, but it's like the Stream Deck's tiny little blocky text brother. But what's cool is that means I can also SSH into this thing, so I can load games on it or back it up all over Wi-Fi. And I used a Compute Module 4, but like I said, you can use a Raspberry Pi Zero 2W or even a 3A+, both of which would use even less power and get better battery life. And that CM4 should be faster than the Null 2 console I built a couple years ago. It runs on the Zero 2W, and I had some trouble with some PlayStation and N64 games. The Compute Module 4 is a lot faster, and to prove that, here's Gran Turismo 2 running just fine on the PlayStation emulator. Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 also ran fine, and even Nintendo 64 emulation runs pretty smooth, though with occasional glitches. Older games like NBA Jam and Earthworm Jim ran great on the Genesis, and I also tested some Super Nintendo games too. And you know what? If Game Gear isn't your jam, you can still emulate Game Boy games too, complete with that bland monochrome color palette. 
everything worked great with the built-in speaker or through my headphones. And just like on the Null 2, running some of these old games with headphones on makes the experience way different. I could never appreciate some of these games' soundtracks on the old color TV we used when I was a kid. This thing is far from perfect, though. There are a few things about it I didn't like, and I don't think this build is for everyone. First, I think the current design is best for Pi Zero or A+. My CM4 seemed to get undervolt warning sometimes, and a few times in the course of testing things, I'd even get these write errors and my microSD card would get corrupted. I think the power delivery from either battery or USB-C is just a little weak for the CM4. And battery life wasn't amazing with just one battery going. There's a battery extension cable to get the other battery wired in, but I didn't have one in time for this video. But with just one battery, I guess that's a feature. <laughs> it carries on the legacy of the Game Gear only getting a few hours of battery life. Also, because I had to swap out the microSD card a few times, I got a little frustrated with the location. It's nice and flush with the cartridge slot, but that made it hard to get a hold of when I took it out. The last thing that was a little frustrating was the software side. There isn't a whole lot of documentation around this build, so if you want to customize your setup, you have to do a little reverse engineering. It is a pretty standard RetroPie build, which is good, but I had to figure out what screen, sound, and GPIO pins it uses for everything. And the FAQ mentions you shouldn't update the system because that could break the drivers. Well, that's certainly not ideal. I mean, if you never connect it to the internet and it works okay for you, that's one thing. But if you want to get on Wi-Fi and modify the system, then updates are kind of important. In the end, though, I'm happy with this build, and I might even buy another kit now that it has HDMI out, too. After all, I also have this blue shell I could build in. But that's another video for another time. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.